Learn audio online with Audio Masterclass. AudioMasterclass.com. Noise as a creative effect. Some of the audio in this video is very quiet. You'll need a very quiet listening environment to monitor successfully on loudspeakers. Studio quality headphones are recommended. Here's a clean recording of bass guitar. This recording is so clean, it's likely that the source track was a virtual instrument. However, it's also possible that a real bass guitar was recorded directly into the audio interface or through a DI box. It's worth considering a perspective from the history of recording dating back to the 1960s. In the 1960s and early 1970s, recordings were made of instruments that were played by human beings, not computers or sequencers. Recordings were made through a mixing console to analogue multitrack tape. The recordings were captured mostly by microphones, or an electric instrument such as a Fender Rhodes piano could be recorded through a DI box connected to a microphone input of the mixing console. Electric guitar and bass guitar would be recorded each through an amplifier and loudspeaker cabinet using a microphone, although the bass guitar could sometimes be DI'd. Also, it was the practice that basic tracks would be recorded with the band all playing together, often with the singer providing a guide vocal that would be overdubbed later. When recording basic tracks, engineers were very concerned with separation. Separation meant having a low level of leakage, spill or bleed, all the same meaning, from one instrument's microphone to another. So acoustic screens would be positioned so that each microphone picked up as little spill as possible from the other instruments. Separation would never be perfect, except for the close mics on the drums. Drums are so loud that they will almost completely overpower the other instruments. So because of spill, a recording could never be perfectly clean. In addition, there would be noise caused by the instrument amplifiers, by low-level signals such as the Fender Rhodes piano requiring a lot of preamp gain, in the mixing console to a small degree, and massively in the analog multitrack tape recorder. So in those times, the engineer's problem was in getting a recording that was clean enough. Fast forward to today, and there's no problem making a recording that's 100% clean, like the bass guitar recording earlier. But the problem now is that when a recording is too clean, and when multiple tracks of 100% clean recordings are mixed together, then the result can be uninteresting and lacking in texture. So when digital audio workstation recording became the norm around the year 2000, the problem was that recordings were too clean. In the following years, harmonic generation, amp emulation, tape emulation and similar plugins became available and are now widely available. These plugins allow us to add warmth to recordings that would otherwise be cold and sterile. But comparatively little attention has been given to spill and noise. Spill is a different topic that will not be covered here. Noise, however, is very relevant to warmth and to the believability of virtual instruments and plug-in emulations of analog hardware. White noise and pink noise. Two commonly referenced types of noise are white noise and pink noise. White noise is a completely random variation in the motion of air molecules or the magnetic orientation of particles in an analog tape or the motion of electrons in a circuit. White noise has equal amplitude at every frequency. As a point of interest, if not direct relevance, white noise as a source of randomness finds uses in science, computing and even lotteries. White noise looks and sounds like this. Pink noise is similar, but instead of being equal at every frequency, it has equal energy in equal logarithmic bandwidth intervals. So in octave bands, for instance, each band is as loud as every other band. Pink noise sounds a little less bright than white noise. Pink noise looks and sounds like this. 
We could try adding white or pink noise at a suitable level to the bass guitar to see if it adds any sense of analog warmth. That was interesting, but clearly there's further to go with this. Why do plugins emulate vintage hardware? There are several possible answers to this question. It sounds good. It's simple to operate. It makes us feel like we're in a pro studio. It offers the certainty that we're using the same equipment as the pros, even though in an emulation. Great records of the past have been made with this equipment. It's tried and tested. Using it avoids uncertainty and risk. It has withstood the test of time. You can take your pick of any or all of the above. However, let's go with It Sounds Good. As an example, we'll consider the Universal Audio 1176 compressor, pictured here in its reissued version. You can see other versions, including the classic Blue Stripe, with a simple web search. We can take the popularity of the 1176 over time as evidence that it sounds good. It would be ripe for emulation by any competent plugin developer who can get access to an example of the hardware unit. So what aspects of the original hardware should the plugin developer emulate? Everything. Why not? It would seem a little crazy not to emulate every aspect of an original piece of hardware. After all, the developer doesn't know for sure why people like it. Leaving out one or any of its characteristics would risk the plugin being unsuccessful in the market. And, as we all know, analog hardware can be noisy. So just to be sure, why not emulate the noise? But being digitally orientated these days, clearly there should be an option to turn the noise off. I'm not aware of any plugin emulation that features noise that can't be switched off, but I'm open to reports and I'll update if I hear anything further. So let's experiment with an emulation of the Universal Audio 1176, which in this instance is the Waves CLA76. If you compare the plugin with the hardware unit, you'll notice that there are extra buttons, one to switch between the bluey and blacky versions of the hardware, there's another to switch in all of the ratio buttons, which can be done for a special effect on the original, and buttons to select which version of analog noise you would prefer, or none. 50 Hz and 60 Hz refer to the electric mains frequencies in Europe and North America respectively. I'm not going to use it for compression since here we're only interested in the noise. So here's what it sounds like with neutral settings and the noise switched off. And now with the noise switched on. As you'll hear, the difference is extremely subtle, but it is there. Here's the noise by itself. You may need to turn up your monitor level to hear it, but don't forget to turn it down after. Now that you've tuned in your ears, here's an example where the noise is switched in and out. We can test this in another way. If the track is duplicated and the noise switched out on the duplicate, and then the duplicate is put through an inverting plugin, then the bass guitar should cancel out leaving only the noise. To be clear, 
In this example, you'll hear only the noise. As you can hear, the noise is pretty much the same either way. This shows us that in this plugin, the analog button only adds noise and does nothing else to the signal. What if you can't hear the noise? I can understand anyone who says that. The noise is definitely there, but when the instrument is playing, it's hard to hear. But suppose that you really like this plugin and you use it on several tracks, let's say 24 tracks. You've left the analog button switched to either 50 Hz or 60 Hz on all of the instances. What does it sound like now? Here's a test. All of the tracks are muted and unmuted a couple of times before the bass starts, so that you can clearly hear the level of the noise. The noise is now clearly audible. This is a warning that unless you deliberately want to add noise, then you need to be careful that the noise is switched off on all of the instances where you don't need it. Bear in mind that the noise will get subjectively worse if you use a high frequency boost after compression. Going back to just one track, the noise is very subtle and you might want to experiment with having more of it but the plugin doesn't offer any way to control the noise. The answer is to create another track, without any audio, just the plugin. Now you can switch the noise off on the instrument track and control the noise fully using the dedicated noise track. Here we have two tracks. This is the bass guitar track, and this is the plugin for the bass guitar. And as we can see here, the analog noise is switched off, so there's no noise on that track. On this AUX track here we have the same plugin with the same settings, and on this one the noise is set to 50 Hz, so we can control the noise separately to the bass guitar. In fact, you can hear the noise now. It might be a little quiet in the background, so let's make it louder. I can do that by adding a trim plugin. So with the trim plugin, I can make the noise 12 decibels louder. That should be clearly audible, but I'll make it even louder by doubling the trim plugin. I can copy it with the same settings. So the noise is now very clearly audible. So I'll take it down in level, and I'll mix it in with the bass guitar. I think that's round about the right level and you can hear the noise in the background now. So we've got a level of minus 11.5. That would be different depending on what you're working with. So let's try it a little too quiet and then a little too loud and then once again just right. So there we have a level of noise that's adding a certain amount of realism to this otherwise very clean recording. The sound texture of the noise. Now that we can hear the noise clearly, we can hear its components, which appear to be a 50 Hz buzz and whitish noise. So it seems like an interesting experiment to try and recreate it. 
So I'll add two more tracks, which can be audio tracks or aux tracks, as all of the sound will come from plug-in signal generators. The CLA-76 noise track will be muted for now. Firstly, the 50 Hz hum. Then white noise at a level that is reasonably in proportion subjectively with the 50 Hz hum. And mixing them together, we get Does it sound like the noise from the CLA-76? I can experiment with the levels and compare. For this example, the noise level of the CLA-76 has been boosted by a further 24 decibels so that it is very clearly audible. Although not too bad, the hum doesn't sound like the hum from the CLA-76. Even when it's around the same level, it becomes inaudible on small speakers, while the CLA-76's hum remains clear. The answer to this is that the hum from the CLA-76 contains harmonics and becomes a buzz. The harmonics of 50 Hz are 100 Hz, 150 Hz, 200 Hz, 250 Hz, etc all the whole number multiples. I could add more signal generator tracks, but an easier way to add harmonics is to use a harmonic enhancement plugin, such as the Sound Toys Decapitator, which works well and is easy to use. Equalization should also help. The next example shows experimentation with the decapitator and EQ leading to a reasonable facsimile of the noise from the CLA-76. Perhaps Waves used a similar method. What I'm going to do here is try and make the noise from the 50 Hz tone and the white noise sound like the noise from the CLA-76. This is the original bass guitar track that I'm not going to use now. So let's have a listen to the CLA-76, see what that sounds like. And then we'll compare it with the 50 Hz and white noise. What we can hear is that the 50 Hz component is at a good level, but on small loudspeakers it probably won't be audible. And what we're hearing is a lot of harmonics from the CLA-76. So what I'm going to do is use a harmonic enhancement plugin to add harmonics to the 50 Hz tone. So the plugin is going to be the Sound Toys Decapitator. So let's just listen to the 50 Hz tone by itself. So I'll increase the drive. I'm definitely getting something there, but let's try these style options. I like this one, N, and this one, P. Let's compare them with the CLA-76. It seems to me that it has too much low frequency energy and it isn't bright enough in the high frequency range. So I'm going to add an EQ.
This looks quite complicated, but what we have here is a high pass filter, we have a low pass filter, low frequency section, low mid frequency, mid frequency, high mid frequency, and high frequency. So it's not too difficult even if you don't use Pro Tools. So let's have a go. I think we've got something which is already quite similar, but I'm going to try boosting the high mid frequency and see what we can get from that. Okay, I think that's quite good. So now we need to look at the white noise and see whether that needs any attention. So let's just come over to this one here. The white noise seems just a little bit too bright, so once again I'll put in the EQ. And I'm going to use the low pass filter. It's too much. Still a little bit too much. I think we'll try just a little bit more level. And I'm going to take away some of the low frequencies as well. So let's listen to it both together. Okay, so it's not exact, but I think it's quite close. Let's listen and compare again. In summary, noise can be useful to add an interesting texture to an otherwise clean and sterile recording. Some plugins emulate the noise of hardware equipment, but it is not controllable. Analog noise can be emulated using a sine wave at 50 or 60 Hz with harmonic generation and EQ together with white noise. Further processing can be applied if desired. I'm David Meller, course director of Audio Masterclass. Thank you for listening.